Hello, Feminine Roadmappers. Welcome back to Feminine Roadmap Podcast, the podcast that helps you navigate the challenges and the changes of midlife and empowers you to live a more vibrant second half. If you are finding us on YouTube today, please don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell so you don't miss any more of this amazing content. And if you're on a podcast platform, please remember to subscribe, rate, and share this conversation. Today, we are going to be talking about something I am passionate about. I'm so excited. We're going to be talking about how we're all innately wired to live a life mostly in connection mode. Our brain and nervous system may just need a little help remembering that not everything in life is an attacking tiger. My guest today is Nancy Sokol Green. She's an educator. She's the creator of Brain Highways Global, and she is the author of Connection Mode, How to Change Your Brain for an Easier Life. Nancy, thank you so much for coming on my show today. It's my pleasure. I'm excited to share. Uh well, we've already I've already cheated and had a little conversation before we hit record. So I'm I'm ridiculously excited to actually learn more from you about why are you so passionate about neuroplasticity, the brain and connection? I didn't start out ever having that my goal. What I was passionate about was why wasn't it started with kids? Why weren't some kids learning, let alone loving to learn like I love to learn. And then I was an educational consultant in the schools. There were kindergartners being kicked out of kindergarten. And it was like, who wakes up if you're a five-year-old and go, oh, I don't want my teacher to like me. I I don't want to have friends. I don't want to learn. So it was just this nagging question of what are we missing? Mm -hmm. And we had to have been missing something because that just didn't make sense to me. And so is almost like a mystery how everything unfolded, but it literally led back to the brain, which literally then also took me to the nervous system, which literally was back in, honestly, in 1999, when I, I'm sorry, um, it's great, uh, 1999, when I first started doing this, um, it seems odd now because the word neuroplasticity is known and people talk about it. I had to convince people back then that just maybe the brain could change. It hasn't been that long that people, they thought, well, if you have this and this, then you're stuck with that forever. And um, so it was a little wild ride at the beginning, but now 22 years later and 20,000 plus people, you will never convince me that the brain can't change. And you will never convince me that there's somebody out there that, oh, that's the asterisk. No, not you, Gina, not you. So like, <laughs> I, I, it's just not, but, but many of us have been led to believe that how i am right now is it Mm -hmm. this is as good as it's going to get so another way of looking at it is instead of waking up every day and thinking i mean the same old this every day is not gonna be any better than the next day it's like no no if you understand how the brain and nervous system can change or even how did it change so i got to that thought (laughs) then the most exciting thing is whatever we're at right now or wherever our brain changed even in a way that maybe wasn't the greatest because the brain can change in all ways that's what people also don't know it's always changing Mm -hmm. that it can change again so let's just imagine somebody out there's going oh i I, you know i don't care if i change my brain or you know i'm not interested we always laugh at brain highways because we say well guess what it's changing anyway Okay, so you might as well get a little control over it that it changes in a way that serves you and allows you to show up as your most awesome self because it will change um, regardless. So that's to me what neuroplasticity is about is um, getting to know your own nervous system, Mm -hmm. your brain, so that it really is working for you and maybe not against you. I'm really amazed at the the progression of this knowledge because there's someone that I read and follow. Her name is Dr. Carolyn Leaf. And she teaches a lot about neuroplasticity and the dendrites and how we can, how, how thoughts are concrete things in our brain, you know, and how our positive and or negative thinking, how it changes the structure of the brain. I've been very fascinated with that. And as a coach, I use these tools that I learn 
to help my clients shift in areas where they're struggling. And I love the idea that there are women like you, and I'm sure there are men as well, who are doing this work so that we can have a more vibrant, connected life. And you talk about connection, Nancy. And I'm kind of curious, when did you kind of go from that educational piece and shift over a little bit? And I know you still do the educational piece. But where did this idea of connection come in to what you do? Well, actually, I I didn't really shift. It just became a wider view. Okay. okay. So when I started looking at what is the biology? I mean, literally, what's the biology of, of why we're not showing up? As, and sometimes people get a glimpse of, oh, that's, oh, now she's back to being that way. Right? I mean, so what, what is that about? So the way I can explain it so simply is, the way we all came into this world with our nervous system, it's an either or system. We're either at any given time in what I call protection mode. Some people might call it survival mode, but I chose to call it protection mode because I want to teach. I'm always educating that when I'm in that frame of mind, my nervous system has chosen a way that it thinks will protect me. Mm. So when we look at people that maybe think, oh, she's so upset and this and that, but instead to help people go, I wonder what shifted her into protection mode. You know, and and even though you and I might not think yelling back at me is going to be a helpful thing, but somewhere my nervous system, and I can explain that why later if you want, when yelling is a very protective thing for you. You know, somebody else that might protect me by just shutting down and just mm -hmm. kind of freezing. But I wanted people to understand that what we're seeing in our behavior, it's either a protection mode behavior, and some are very interesting or subtle. We tend to think of like the overt ones, but there's some very subtle absolute protection mode behaviors or we're in connection mode and we're supposed to be in connection mode most of our life the way it, it kind of has rolled out for many people is they seem to be stuck in protection mode and they've forgotten about this other part of our nervous system but when we're in protection mode everything is on hold mm -hmm. everything i would make a decision in protection mode Learning's not going to happen. We could revolutionize education if we could have a little app where teachers could like plug in and go, oh, 90% of my <laughs> class in protection mode, because like I say, it doesn't have to be obvious. Better get them everybody back to connection mode before we learn, before we go to Thanksgiving dinner. It would be nice if everybody's in connection mode, but everything in protection mode is on hold and um, can affect our health, can affect just everything. So the name of the game has to be is how do I get back to connection mode and how did I get stuck in protection mode in the first place? So when you say that about thoughts, thoughts are, are very important, but the nervous system that puts us in protection mode, it doesn't even involve the higher centers of the brain. And what blew me away is that it happens in less than a second. Mm. So my nerv your nervous system mind right now, the part that I'm talking about, the older part is just literally going, it's like almost like a little radar, is Nancy safe? Is Nancy safe? Is Nancy... That's all it cares. If you said, what about being joyful? Joyful, this part of the nervous system doesn't even know what that is. Okay, And happy and all the things we want. This is only, is Nancy safe? And what it does at any second, if it thinks something, and it only just thinks something is a threat, it then sounds, oh, it scans your whole entire history. So like I say, we could be talking right now, right here, something you see, your nervous system will <gasps> Checkbox one, checkbox two, checkbox three, sound the alarm. And mine's still going, what, what happened to Gina? You know what I mean? My, my, mine's just fine. Which, as a side note, is why it never helps to tell someone else to calm down. Because your nervous system went, what do you mean calm down? Mine just assessed five things. Or, and then I get you more upset. But the whole point is, is that now I'm in protection mode. Okay? And now I'm going, to, not only does it put me in protection mode, there's a whole biological response. It actually also decides how I'm going to go into it. Am I going to do some kind of flight behavior, which might look really sweet, like, oh, I got to go get some water right now. I'll come back and do that later, but I really get, get me out of here. Am I going to do some power over response, which we call like the fight or resistant. Mm -hmm. But when we see a bear in the wilderness, we're told to get big, right? So maybe yelling at you got you to back away, right? So then I might do that, or I might do a freeze, because that's a biological response to that maybe if I was in the wild, you just didn't notice me if I didn't move. And if none of those work, and this is where it gets kind of chronic for a lot of people and it becomes their automated response. It's like the turtle that goes into the shell, I just check out. 
and I just, I might be looking at it right now, but I'm, I'm not here. I can't feel. I've trained my brain now not to feel, and that, ha- but it's all still happening internally. Mm-hmm. So what's important to understand is that all that happened without ever talking to your higher centers of your brain. So now your higher centers of your brain come down. And let's face it, our brain likes to know. It just does. It feels better when I know. So it turns out our cortex, our higher centers, has no qualms about uh, making a whopper. So now it wants to make sense of um, what happened. So it might say, oh, my boss is such a jerk. He's always picking on me. Okay, so now I make the thought that you're talking about in the story. But in widening that view is what I want people to understand is that's what keeps me in protection mode. That story. So here's, mm-hmm. I'll give you one already takeaway to do. Here's the one simple thing. As soon as I recognize I'm in protection mode and then that story comes in, or I'm so stupid, why did I say that? Or you know what I mean? Or mm-hmm. I never, get, whatever the stories are, we all know what they are, right? There's only one story. If you want to get back to connection mode is one of the ways. It's once upon a time, my nervous system made a risk assessment and decided a way to protect me. Mm. Now, it's a really boring story, but guess what? (laughs) Boring is good to get out of protection mode. You know, pouring the kerosene on top of the fire is what keeps it going more. So so that is the first thing. So it's an either or system. Once we get in connection mode, everything that we ever want in life happens in connection mode. So I stand by things like compassion, curiosity, courage, kindness, creativity, all the things we want. You can't tell people to be that. I can say you need to be more compassionate. And again, if you're in protection mode, I might as well be saying because it's not coming in. And even if I'm in connection, connection mode, it's, it's like you don't have to tell me that. That's the byproduct. That's the byproduct. All those wonderful things that happen are just the byproduct. So to me, instead of trying to fix everything, that's what people are doing today, right? The thing today is I've got the ADD or I've got depression or I've, I'm not minimizing any of those things, trust me. But, it, but there's so many things that my brain worked in. Was there something that tied them all together? And to me, in my line of work, it led back to being stuck in protection mode. And then these things made so much sense. And then having the experience of getting to work with so many thousands of people when they get into connection mode, even though they come to brain highways for those specific things, and again, I am not minimizing them. They're, they are your struggles, whatever they are. I can't read this, that. But they don't want to talk about that at the end. You know, all they talk, talk about life in connection mode because there were so many even more surprises and it was a bigger picture. So to me, then the question would be how do you get to connection mode? That could mm. be a question, right? You know what I'm saying? Is how, how do I get to connection mode if that's where I want to hang out? And the answer for me and how this all unfolded was a flexible nervous system. Okay. Flexible nervous system. And the reason that is, is because I don't care who you are, King, King of England now, or the richest person in the world. What I love about it, all our nervous systems work exactly the same. You can be the richest person or you can be a person homeless on the street. Mm -hmm. And so guess what? All the people who want to sell you happiness, this and that, Every nervous system is going to put you in protection mode as soon as it thinks it's a threat. And it's going to be wrong like 99.9% of the time. Mm -hmm. And it's never going to care. I always imagine that I talk to my nervous system, right? It's not going to care because it's going to say to me, if I say, what did you do that for? It was just an email from my boss and I got all worked up and it wasn't even that bad. My nervous system, this part would say, job well done. How about saying you're still alive, right? That's it. That's all they care about. So it's never going to reflect and go, ooh, next time maybe I should consider it. It can't because if it really was an attacking tiger, there's no room for reflection like, hmm, or compassion. Maybe he didn't get enough to eat on the savanna today. Maybe I will give him an arm. I mean, it doesn't work that way. So the point is, is we are always going to go into protection mode just like that. You can go to that yoga class. Feels so awesome, right? You mm-hmm. come out and you look at your phone and there's the one text. It's gone. We know this. So the answer is not to try to deny that. But the, so we're going to accept that we're going to go into protection mode. But here's the big but. If I have learned and rewired my nervous system to be flexible, I have learned the tools to just as quickly get back to connection mode. 
and then mm -hmm. that so so a flexible nervous system is the gateway to connection mode and connection mode means i get to show up who i am be there for other people um be creative be curious it's just everything happens in connection mode so when we talk about connection mode nancy we're not just talking about connection with other people we're talking about reconnecting internally I, I, am i understanding that correctly well that's the only place that can change so <clears throat> another myth is that um if, if my husband or if my child would just change i'll feel better <laughs> <laughs> and, and then that right there that thought creates a disconnect because first of mm -hmm. all i whether you say it to me or not i don't want you to feel like you're fixing me because if you're fixing me, then you're saying I'm broken. And if I'm broken and then I already have some programs where I think maybe I am, that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. But we also have to believe or not, and a big part of the flexible nervous system that really has not made it to prime time is if your lower brain has finished developing. And if it didn't finish its development in the first year of life, you have just increased your chances of being in protection mode almost all of your life by about 100 fold. Because when the lower brain, and we also can go back at any time in our life and finish the lower brain development. It's part of what we call in the trifecta of getting a flexible nervous system, the repair part. Because you may take for granted right now, when you say being connected to others, you have to be connected to yourself too. And I know you meant with thoughts, but I'm talking about bio biology first. Do you take for granted that you just know when you're hungry? You have a sense when you're hungry, right? Right. Do you get a sense when you know you're full? Mm -hmm. Do you know when it's too cold and, oh, I must need a jacket? Uh, I'm just going to go a long list like, oh, I kind of have to go to the bathroom, but, you know, I can finish this interview. It's not uh, versus I have to go now. So many people we work with whose lower brain did not finish developing, and I'm only giving you a small number of those kind of characteristics. Their body doesn't give them that information. What you causes that? What, that's what, what I'm so you can't take credit. Did you go to school to learn how to know when I need to go to the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> so, but these are the innate ways that we connect. Okay. You know, if we were in person right now, we weren't taught, but there's just this accepted distance that you and I keep a space between us. And yet there's so many people that we call them space invaders. Again, the mm -hmm. cortex coming down and they know that you're annoyed with us, but they don't really get it. They're not getting the feedback. Or if I was sitting here right now and I start tapping my foot, okay, I don't know if you can hear me doing that. If I don't have some of these neural connections from the first year of life, I might be in the middle of talking to him going, where's my foot? Where's my foot? And that's really going to flip out my nervous system. Because right now, as I'm talking to you, I know where my feet are. I don't have to look at them. I know where my belly button is. And I don't have to, I don't have to go, oh, oh, there it is. And then that gives us a tremendous amount of security. It gives us a grounding. So not only do many people not get that message or get it all the time, it can be inconsistent, okay? And then I intuitively start tapping because, oh, yeah, there's my foot. I'm excited. And then what happens? My mom or my teacher will stop tapping. And now I have even more of a disconnect. So the first mm -hmm. year of life, believe it or not, is like the most important for the brain. Mm -hmm. This is what's not. Uh, this is one of the reasons I wrote the book as well, because this has not made it to prime time, and it needs to. So during the first year of life, if you put a baby down on the floor anywhere in the world, and not, and especially now because everyone's all these cute little baby things, but they're all um, snuggled in. There's no movement. Okay, we are all innately wired to move a certain way in the first year of life. It's not just to get up and walk. That's been the big myth. It's so that all these important neurological connections are made that give us automated brain processing skills that we need for everything we do the rest of our life. Hmm. And if we skipped over them, we will still get up and walk because from a survival stage, the brain goes, not a good thing to be like a grounded organism, you know, the rest of your life. And we look like everybody else. But we are now trying to get through this world without some basic internal sensing. How can we connect with others if we're not even getting it? So coolest thing is if you missed plan A, which many, many, many people do, and now it's more so than ever because we have so many baby ap apparatus and so many things that are well-intended, but they restrict the natural movement and nobody's looking for it. 
if it was up to me, there'd be like a buzz. Like if you started to get up and walk and go buzz, buzz, and you'd go to your doctor and go, what's the buzz? Oh, Gina, you didn't, you didn't creep enough. You didn't crawl enough. You didn't do the, the integrated <laughs> movements. Get back on the floor. But here's the good news. You can go back at any age, any time in your life. And if, with a little bit of a guidance, your brain will go back and get those highways now. So we have people mm. in their 50s who have, our oldest participant, 76, waited 76 years to get some of these natural innate sensations. Um, we had a psychologist who just literally sobbed. He said, psychiatrist actually, he thought he was a klutz all his life. Okay, because that's what we call it. That's the name of it, right? But when he got into his 50s, the amount of falling he was doing and all kinds of things was really interfering with his health. And again, it wasn't that he became more klutzy. What he was using to compensate, because that's what happens if we don't get those functions. And then the higher centers of the brain as we get older, get more and more tired. It's like, really? Like, you know, they're working so much harder. You get to a point sometimes where your compensations don't work. And then it really gets hard. So at 60, this psychiatrist ends up having better balance than he ever had in his entire life. I mean, and, and it's just phenomenal because he finally got the highways. But a lot of the older participants we have do a lot of crying at the beginning, but it's happy tears of just realizing I am really amazing considering all the things I've done when they understand how much of their lower brain wasn't developed and start seeing the difference. So I could talk to you all day long about getting connection mode, but if you're lower and how we do it, because we call it a trifecta and give you all the tools, but if your lower brain's not fully developed, um, you will just be doing all day long the tools. You know what I mean? You'll constantly be doing mm -hmm. it more, but um, better than nothing. But this is a huge, huge piece that um, for whatever reason, just not out there. Well, I can probably give you some reasons why, but it's, it's contrary to every baby gadget because it's contrary to that what for free you can get on the floor and, and get your focus back and get coordinated. I mean, there's not a lot of um, marketing incentive to tell people you actually have the power, <laughs> but- um, But I'm yeah, interested I'm to know you we you talked about this before we hit record, but you mentioned that this gentleman who was 60 was getting klutzier and all these things were happening. And we talked about off the recording that there's a certain kind of idea out there that if you are of a certain age, you just have to accept certain difficulties, loss of balance, uh, loss of mobility. And there's all of these things that are being told to us. But what you're actually saying is when we can get our nervous system online and our lower brain primed, get those neural pathways going, we can actually change that narrative, literally change by changing literally, our brain. Biologically. And, and I would throw out to the listeners, possibly what you're seeing, what you're thinking is aging is just your compensations have run out. Mm. Now, mm -hmm. we actually see, you know, 10 year olds whose compensations run out. You know, what I mean, you can run out at any time in your life. But if you're somebody who kind of looked back and went, you know, my life was pretty easy until or until this. And that. Also, chronic health problems can be very much related because healing. So just think about whatever health problem I have. So it, it might be again, oh, well, now I'm this age. So, of course, I'm taking meds for this and this. And again, I'm not putting any negative cloud over anything anybody's doing that helps them feel better at this moment. And that's the beautiful thing about changing the brain and nervous system. There's none of like, ooh, 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 don't do that if you're gonna do this. It's just a wider view, right? Mm -hmm. Anything you're doing, take it, run with it. But what if you're still waking up with some pain and this and that? What would be the wider view? So I wanna be really clear, I'm only about addition not about subtraction, okay? You know, so it's not like one thing, but this wider view, what if there was something that my brain has been compensating for and maybe compensated well for X amount of years, but for whatever reason. So I'll give you the example. I think we were talking about falling. Everyone thinks, oh, if you're a senior now, and then, mm -hmm. and then there's doing the um, stats that once you fall, then your chances of this happening to you and this and this and this. Well, again, the way my brain works is like, why, why would if I lived in this house for 20 years, 
Now I'm 65, I trip on the carpet and break my hip and fall or whatever. It just seemed like, what? <laughs> so when we go back and look at the early brain, one of the things that we get from uh, the way it's supposed to be is a well-developed vestibular system. And it's a myth that we have five senses. So vestibular um, processing, and it's not me just making this up, it just is literally probably one of our most important senses because all our other senses, the ones we've learned about, are processed in relation to how the vestibular system is working. So if that's not working really well, maybe I have people tell me I have an auditory processing problem, but we would look back for, or is it a vestibular because the auditory is not going to work well if this isn't working well, but it has a lot to do with our balance. And so mm -hmm. to, for us to have natural balance, we use our eyes, we use our vestibular system, and we use something called the proprioceptive system. They all three work together. But let's say since I got up and walked, I didn't really develop my lower centers of the brain. So I have, you know, some proprioceptive, maybe some vestibular, but it's not optimal. But my eyes, I use my eyes. That's what's really keeping me balanced. And the way we kind of bust people on that is if you can go like this and lift one leg and you're fine. Some people can't even lift one leg, you know, to balance. But then if we ask you to shut your eyes and whoa, mm -hmm. then there's your first clue that your eyes have been a lot more involved. But what happens as we get older in general, a lot of times our eyes do don't work as well, right? They're part of the aging with it. So what if that senior fall was more because my eyes now aren't compensating as well for a vestibular system and proprioceptive system that was always kind of on the edge? And the reason that information, and I always say what if, right? But because I can do something about that. I can improve not only my lower brain at any age, but I can even just go back and do some things for proprioception and vestibular system. And then I might discover, wow, when I do my vestibular system, I'm more awake because it has to do with your alertness. And there's just this whole cascade of things. So it's always just the let's play what if game. What if? And mm. what's the downside of looking at it that way? To me, none. Mm. It's an incredible thing to really recognize how our bodies work. And there's so many systems that we don't know about. We make assumptions, like you said, you know, that these are the five senses, which, of course, we do have those five senses. But what I hear you saying is those are secondary to these other systems in order to work in better balance. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Right. So when people go to like, uh, it's very common now for people to say they have sensory processing problems. Yes. I would never say you don't, but the little part of me goes, but why do people have sensory processing problems now? When I was a kid, nobody had that. Okay. So mm -hmm. then we go peel back a little more and oh, those to me are symptoms of incomplete lower brain development. And the reason I say that is because not only do we get so many people who have spent years in, you know, certain kind of OT or PT kind of thing. And again, whatever you're doing in the meantime is great, but I'm always wanting to go to the root. And so, yeah. and, and I'm always, and there's like vision therapy, great if it's helping people, but I didn't have to go to school to learn how to track my eyes. And then the other thing is if I'm learning how to do all these things through the higher centers of my brain with enough practice, I, you can create some highways, but the minute I go in protection mode, because they're not automated natural, I'll forget it. Mm. That's the what? other piece to that. You see, because uh, 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 I'm going to go back to how I'm more innately wired. So I want to be innately wired, these processing kinds of um, uh, pathways that we need to have. Another way I'll give you an example. We, we use the word read the room, you know, addition mm -hmm. to the room. You know how I many people can't read the room? But that's not because they're not trying. That is a biological thing. Your neuroception is a biological thing that allows you to accurately read safety and danger cues. Mm -hmm. If my lower brain's not developed, if I'm stuck in protection mode, everything is an attacking tiger. And then mm. I react that way. And then people go, oh my gosh, Nancy's so overreacting again. She's so high maintenance. And we go <laughs> with the stories and then I disconnect more. And it's, it's, but we don't realize that neuroception is linked to the lower brain development in our nervous system. Interoceptions, when I'm talking about the innate sensitive 
um, two weeks ago in a program, we had a 45 year old man that goes, I don't believe it. It's the first time in my life I feel full. I've wow. met so many people in my life that have never experienced feeling full. Then take where that may lead to eating disorders. Take where that may lead to just how can you still be hungry and and but you only know you. So you just you just feel like everyone's that way. But why doesn't it bug them that they're you know and and conversely some people don't when it's really underdeveloped some people don't sense they're hungry. They're just not really hungry, and and but these are basic survival neurology and biology that we need. So just think about if I'm walking around the world and I look like everybody else and I don't have those connections, mm. how am I going to even be able to really show my awesome self all the time? See, this is what I get passionate about talking about. Yeah, it <laughs> because it brings hope to people who have totally. walked through the world kind of asleep, if you will. Totally. Not even asleep. Um, that's where all your negative thoughts come into. I must be mm -hmm. so stupid. I must be. I yeah. always give this analogy. It's not that people can't hear what you're saying, like be kind or or pay attention. Pay attention is like the biggest um, connection mode circuit breaker that I could ever tell. Because if I showed you how many things had to be in place in the brain and nervous system to pay attention, nobody would say that to somebody. And mm. it's never going to be, oh, now I can. Yeah. The interesting question again is why do people lose focus? Mm. Why do that? But what happens is, is that you just really think that you must be stupid or you must be because, so here's the analogy I'll give. What if I um, told you, let's make up a world that being tall is really important. That's what, that's what it is. And so I'm your mom and I just really love you. So I just say, Gina, you need to grow taller. Okay, because let's just say you're short. Okay, so I'm saying it from my heart, though. There's no bad guys in my way of looking at this biology. There's just a lot of misunderstood. That's so I'm qualifying that. So it's not that I'm not a good mom. But I'm, I, everyone told me she's got to be tall. If she's not tall, because then I even start doing my nervous system. If she's not tall, then she's not going to do well in school. If she doesn't do well in school, she's mm. not going to go to a good college. If she doesn't go to a good college, she's not going to get a job and she's going to live with me forever. And I'm literally time traveled. The brain will let you do that. So I go, <laughs> Gina, you really need to get and grow taller. So you as a child at first, why wouldn't you want to please? So you do, mm -hmm. but you're not wired to grow taller on demand. So you might first try a few things and then really quickly, your nervous system goes, this is not within reach. And that's going to put you in protection mode. But as your mother, I don't understand that. So I say again, Gina, Gina, you really need to grow taller. So this time you may be your nervous system does flight like, oh, I will, mom, but I have to go. I have to just go, you know, clean my room a little or something like that. But I'm not going to give up because the world has told me mm. it's different than pay attention, really. Right. So anyways, and so I say, Gina, and I might even get a little mad at Gina, you know, you need to grow taller. And maybe now you'll do power over and go, you grow taller, you know, because <laughs> I because, again, I can't do this. And then at yeah. one point. I'm just going to check. You're going to tell me to go as soon as you say, uh oh, here comes, here comes mom. She's going to tell me to go talk. And I just checked out because I, the nervous system has said, this is too painful. I can't do it. And so I just use that as a fantasy thing, but it is like pay attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is like be kinder. It's not that I didn't hear the words, but I don't physiologically yet. And that's the key word yet. Um, and then I told you the cortex is going to come down and just make up all kinds of whoppers then to make sense of this. Yeah. It, as you're telling me these things, I'm thinking of situations in my own life, as well as in relationship with different people, because um, the environment that the people I have in mind grew up in was suppressive emotionally. And so the mom didn't have the capacity. She she actually had, uh, we believe, Asperger's. And so you always think that person's different, right? Like you recognize that something's different about them, but everyone just kind of writes it off. But I've watched the, I guess, after effects of 
having a disconnected mother. Now I have no idea and not, I'm not even asking to open this can of worms because uh, it's not necessary anymore, but it is interesting for me to think about, you know, knowing people that are so disconnected and how they protected themselves. That's what I'm listening to is that protection piece and the way I know exactly what you're talking about by experience that you know, when I meet someone who has very strong, like you, I, I call it, you know, safety mode, protection mode, you sense that instant, whether they're, like you said, disappearing or they're overtly angry, like everything's a reaction. Or, yes, exactly. And I, uh, wow, that is, uh, that's an incredible thing. And, and as I think about that, I recognize that for me, when I look at someone in that place, because I've been there myself, let's say uh, survival mode was something that was brought to my attention. <laughs> wow, you've spent your life in survival mode and you stand back and go, ah, I understand why I was in that mode. Absolutely. But I often say, and I think you'll agree with this, that what has served us in the past doesn't necessarily continue to serve us. Like there was probably a point where you needed that for you're, quote you're survival. You are spot on. And this is really important to tell people. First of all, how, whatever happened in the past, the nervous system doesn't even do time. So you can just create your own reality right now, but it is a protection moment. So let's just give an example. Let's say I'm in a home and let's just say the dad is, well, now we would say himself in protection mode, but we don't understand that, right? You know what right. I mean? So, so we don't know when he comes home. We don't know if that door is going to slam, if he's going to be in that kind of mood or mm -hmm. if he's going to be. And if I don't do what he wants, if he says everyone sits still like that, um, chances are maybe something really bad happened. Or yeah. even, even not necessarily physically, but just all the other. So I learned as a protection mode response. And the reason I'm going to bring this one up because I don't think people think of it as protection mode to be not a people pleaser. What I got, a lot of people I meet as adults say I'm a people pleaser. You are probably a people appeaser. Oh. And the difference is, is that, let me give you the difference. If I just want to make you soup because you don't feel good and I just doing it, what I call it from connection mode from my heart. And then I, and I'm not attached to whether you like it all, that's pleasing. I just want to please, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm thinking it'll please you whether it does or not. That's not the people I meet that say they're people pleaser. And after a while, when they get older too, they start getting resentful. It's like, when am I going to get my needs met? The difference is the appeasing is I did that behavior of being so compliant or whatever out of fear. Mm. And whenever we do something out of fear, we are in protection mode. The same thing with perfectionism. Nobody was born. People, people tell me all the time, they say, you know what, I um you don't get it. Perfectionism runs in my family like it was your DNA. <laughs> it does run in that that's the program that gets downloaded and yeah. that the people, then that's how I fit in. But nobody, um, no, no baby is born and goes, oh, I need to do that burp better. That was not a perfect burp. <laughs> okay. But so we learn these things. But again, it may have been a very protective way of, of being back then. But just as you so absolutely said is, that's an old program. And if I have my computer and I have a program that I downloaded, you know, in 1999, perhaps, and I got to clear some space here too, there's only so much, maybe it's time to delete that one. Yeah. But again, you can't just say to delete it. So there's a whole way of how the nervous system works to how you really biologically change. Um, I, I like to use words that make it just seem not so science, but what it is, is that every memory we have, it's supposed to be during the day, something happens. I told you, maybe I go into protection mode. Oh, I resolve the threat. That's what it's supposed to be. And I don't mean intellectually, the body got the message. Mm. And then when I go to sleep at night, sleep is not just sleep, it's a million things. But one of the things the nervous system does at night, it can, and brain, it consolidates all the day's activities. And what we want to get is a date stamp, done filed away, everything gets filed away in your brain, but we'll never probably ever see that one again. Let's say somebody said something to you really snarky today. Like, mm -hmm. seriously, you think you can do a podcast? Whatever, I'm just saying whatever. Now, 
if it didn't trigger anything in your past history, you, it, it's going to be fine. But if it was like, oh, maybe I already have a imposter syndrome kind of, you know, program going where pe- my parents told me, to, who do you think you are? You, you think you can go out? Whatever. It doesn't really matter. And again, not mm. blaming anybody. And I freeze and I don't respond. And I don't know the tools that I'm talking about. I don't even recognize. And so later in the day, I don't resolve it. Now I go to sleep at night and the nervous system goes, whoa, that never got resolved. So to me, it gets filed away like with a red neon sign going, danger, danger. Mm -hmm. danger." So now anything in the present for the rest of your life that slightly reminds you of that is what's in the check boxes when it goes through it. So this is why something that might be stressful on a one to 10, a one or a two, that maybe I act as a 10 and people go, Nancy, you're so overreacting. Yes. But I'm bringing in the past. And guess what? We can go back and get date stamps on those memories. And we're, those are what we would, in a common vernacular, call triggers, right? They are definitely triggers. But what I want people to know is, again, it's not an intellectual trigger. <laughs> Do you know right, right, this right. Is, this is going to get triggered before your brain even comes in. Sometimes we know why we got triggered. Sometimes we don't. Yeah. Okay. But the yeah. main thing is, is that the... the so everybody has them. There's nobody out there. That n- nobody out there. They got every. We, I kind of jokingly say with my grandkids right now because we've been teaching them from day one. And I tell my daughter, my oldest grandchild is five, and I tell her, maybe we should just let him have a couple of things that you know he got left to go to therapy later in life, so we'll feel like he's with <laughs> the rest of his age group. We don't really want him to resolve everything, but but it's it's so fun to watch how we are so innately wired to do this, that little kids get it faster sometimes than adults because they don't have the decades of downloading other people's program. So when you mentioned emotions, so the nervous system can't really talk, but it does. It does it in two ways. It, if we start to become mindful, everybody knows at least one or two or three ways that your body does something when you are in protection mode. For me, it's like my right shoulder. I don't know why it's not the left shoulder, but I'll feel like a tightening here. Mm-hmm. And maybe you just said something. I don't even know what it is. Oh, like, that was that. Or uh, like on my diaphragm. Some people will say they get a tingling on their face or a gut punch, mm-hmm. but it's really helpful to now start being aware of that. Or if somebody's yeah. listening going, I don't know what she means. Honestly, by me just asking that question, you'll start to be aware of it because then that's your first clue. I went into protection mode. And if I can do something right there to bring myself back versus letting it get bigger and bigger, I'm already doing a lot better. And um, so we need we need to know how to uh, recognize. And then the other thing is the emotions. Mm -hmm. So emotions to me are the nervous system talking to us, which is why we don't want to ignore them. So the nervous system saw there was a threat and maybe I'm angry. Now, again, intellectually doesn't mean then yelling and screaming at you is the way to resolve this, but there's an emotion there or there's a sadness there. If we don't help them pass, so they're supposed to be there short term, they're like visitors. We don't want our visitors to camp out in our backyard. We don't want them to move into our basement, but we welcome them there and then they need to go. So we have to, first of all, not only help people, how do you have them pass. Mm. But I meet so many people. I always love the men. The men, So many of the men in our program come because they really came for their kids. But in our family program, you have to do it alongside of them. So I don't want to just pick on men, but we might as well. Because they're so cute in this. I mean, in a cute way, because it'll be the dad, like the third week of the program that will go, you know, I, I think I've been in protection mode all my life. I, I think this is really me. And we're going, yeah, maybe. You know? um, and so the whole thing about emotions and women will do this too, but people will tell me I don't do emotions. And I always go, Oh, you're so cute. That's like saying I don't do digestion. We do. You just don't see it. But here's the danger part because we do do emotions. So if we've taught our brain to not feel them and to keep Mm. them down, it requires, first of all, tremendous amount of energy to keep those emotions suppressed. Mm. And more times than not, they will show up as a physical problem. Yes, health. It affects the, mm -hmm. it just Mm -hmm. will. It's just, so we just have to, but maybe I didn't feel emotions because I was told not to. You know what I mean? Like we don't feel emotions in this house. Oh, well, oh, we'll do sad and mad. And not even sad, maybe mad. Mad, mad and happy. (laughs) 
um, maybe um, I can't go there. Like I say, if I don't have the tools, I maybe won't go there for that really grief. And I understand that if I'm on the top of a cliff and there's a really deep ocean and you say, jump, I'm going, any chance I'm coming back up? I'm not going. So if, if you tell me to go to that place where I don't want to feel that was so painful and I don't mm. think I'm ever going to get back, because remember my nervous system maybe spent four decades keeping that away. The beauty part is when you start becoming a flexible nervous system and you have the experience that you have the tools, how to get back, you'll make the jump. Mm. Or, or another favorite story of mine is um, a dad says to me, he's like 45 maybe or something. And he said, okay, what's going on here, Nancy? He goes, I haven't cried like in, you know, maybe four decades at least, right? And I'm driving along the, you know, in the car and I hear a song comes up and it reminds me of my mother and I start to cry. And then I start sobbing. What, what are you doing to me? What is going on? <laughs> and I said, well, here's what I think, because he was somewhat uh, far along the program. Your nervous system now thinks it's safe enough for you to cry. Uh... And those tears have been there for decades. Yeah. You know, you're reminding me of something I, um, I've i shared with other people about a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Fabulous book. Best title ever. I gave it the award for the best title ever. <laughs> and I'm, you're talking and I'm, I'm listening through that book. And uh, you talked about, you know, some people feel it in their face. Some people feel it in their gut. And if, if somebody hasn't listened to me before... Um, I share how um, my mom was abused by my stepfather. So for years, my trigger area was my gut. So like a movie, any, you know, I, I historically avoid violent films and everything because it's just, well, one, it's not entertaining. But people who haven't lived in abuse don't have the same connection to oh, you have a visceral response you have you know, absolutely biologically visceral response bring in your nervous system is correctly saying stay away stay yes away, stay away for you. yes and it's so interesting because i when you talk about where the body feels it i have lived that and it's such a powerful thing it's like our memories have to go somewhere so mm -hmm. how our how we cope our brain if you will and our nervous system it has to go somewhere. And if we're not connected and we're not, like you said, getting that timestamp, because I liked that analogy, then the body, instead of it passing like a cloud, the body goes, great, I have to file this somewhere. Right? It's exhausting. It's exhausting. We actually even do parts, believe it or not, when, but we would never, we don't do a lot of the going back by just talking about it. Because if you just talk about it and don't do some of the actual techniques that um, don't get the nervous system all worked up. We're just reinforcing it, right? But yes. we actually will even say like, oh, you might say gut, but, but I wouldn't do it without doing one of these techniques. But, you know, thank you so much. You have just been carrying this load for so long. So part of getting the date, date stamp, a small part of it, even our nervous system, oh, you've worked so hard, but I'm okay now. I can go into whatever, you know what I mean? Or whatever it is, because that was then, but a lot of times we just have to teach the nervous system, believe it or not, is that I did survive. Mm. Because I think those not date stamp memories, again, if I was to imagine what a nervous system would say to us, it's like, oh, I didn't do my job. Oh my gosh, I've got to do it better and quicker and harder now, right? Because yes. this part is only about keeping you alive. We don't care if you have chronic health problems. We don't care if you disconnect from everybody. We don't care if you're an abusive home. You're alive. And I'm not really exaggerating for that older part of our nervous system mm -hmm. but it really needs to be in the background because yeah. the problem is we're never not the well i didn't actually tell you the biology but connection mode to me is i got so excited when i found the research on this because we'd already been doing it so i love when research backs up what we've been doing but yes yes we're always saying that the gold um, when you're in connection mode it's the gold and it comes leading from your heart okay your heart would never if you're a kid say to um let's steal your brother's ipad because he's not sharing with you that's not coming from your heart even a, a five-year-old knows that right so it turns out we have more highways literally from our heart to our brain mm. than we do our brain to our heart and so first of all what did that tell me then what should be leading so mm. we want to lead with the heart but you don't want to get rid of the cortex so the heart is quiet 
it's always there. And so, like I said, when I say it's an either or, it's what's running, but we don't ever like lose our heart. So the heart might say to you, go for it, go for it. Like something you're thinking of doing, right? Right. And then your brain's going, oh, but we don't have the money. We don't have the skills. We don't got... So the difference now is when we understand how this works is we need, the heart can't just get you there on its own. But instead of ignoring that message, we work together, we collaborate. Okay, mm -hmm. so if I'm in connection, if I stay in connection mode, how might I get some money? How might I do this? And it's phenomenal. And that's that's the combination of it. So, but it's, we've flipped it. We're a society that lives in our mind. Yeah. And, and I think that just looking, and in the back of our brain, all the fear. So if you look at the world today and you see all the divisiveness, I just see so many people stuck in protection mode. Mm -hmm. and, and what you were saying also is, I don't know all your history exactly, but what I know from the experience of people who have been in really tougher childhoods, let's say, than, than other ones, when you get on the other side, you have to do yourself first, though, again, when you get and you get in connection mode, you by default, look at the people that you thought were the worst in the whole world, in a compassionate way. And I know that seems like a real big stretch, but I can't even tell you how many brain highways have gone back on their own after the connection mode and reconnected with a family member that they have not talked to like in a decade, never went back and rehashed everything, just went back in connection mode, which then that person's nervous system, like, you know, and it doesn't mean when you're in connection mode, you let people hurt you. You know I mean? I right. want to be really clear. It's not like you're just, oh, everything up, but, but it is, um, it is a different mindset in the sense that becomes automated to looking at people with curiosity and compassion. The minute I look at them with judgment, I've already taken myself into protection mode. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and and I want to be really clear too. I've been doing this now for you know over twenty years. There's no mastery of this. So if you had a hidden camera in my house right now, like a little nanny camera or something, and you go, "Ha! Ah, I caught her yesterday in protection mode. She's such a fraud." I'd go, "Yeah, of course. I'm human. I told you. I'm gonna go." into protection mode. The difference is it's way less because I am spending more time in connection mode. It's way less intense if I do. It's also uh, way shorter. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm, I'm recognizing it. And even still, I'm going to put an asterisk once in a while, because I really recognize when I'm in protection mode now. And it wasn't that long ago I, I did I'm like, yeah, I'm in protection mode. And I don't care. I'm gonna stay here because I'm so unprotected. I go. I'm just gonna be mad. I'm gonna be mad for you know because I feel like being mad. And then there's a little voice because I've automated that goes, "You can, but you know everything's just gonna be on hold, and you know at this point in life you're gonna get back to connection mode. So knock yourself out. Take as long as you want, but and then it's kind of like, okay, we may go mad for ten more minutes. <laughs> but, but also sometimes for grief, you do have to go through it a whole day. You know what I mean, or two days. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's not a time limit on it, but the difference is, the absolute difference, I know I will be back. Yeah. And I want people out there who don't even know what I'm talking about going, at least to be curious and go, really? There's another place that I could be hanging out? And I want them to know it's already wired in them. Mm. It's already wired. It's just needing that nudge to how to get get all the systems working as intended. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And I think we could probably, I could talk to you for a whole nother hour because this is, this is where freedom lies. Mm -hmm. And, and that is what I try to help people get you to. And so it's right so it. powerful. It's so far. And because I do believe we came here to, we're awesome, uh, you know, but you can say that all day long, oh, you're awesome as a kid. And goes, really? I'm kicked out of every class and this and that. So, so to me, what gets in the way? So it's not that nobody's awesome. So if you see I have my hand up on my face, it's always there, but there's gunk, for lack of mm -hmm. a better word, from us not understanding. So isn't it cool? We can just get rid of the gunk. And there she is. And like <laughs> I say, and, and chances are, depending on how much we don't have the highways, maybe it shows up before 50% of the time. Now I'm showing up that way 95% of the time. Maybe um, I have kids that parents are like shocked. They go, oh my God, my kid is actually kind. My kid is funny. It's like, that's always been your kid. <laughs> that's always been your kid. But not being able to 
it can be overwhelming if so many of those highways are not in place and mm. add to it the rest of the world doesn't know and then we'll judge you mm -hmm. and think that's you and the stories pile up and our beliefs pile up because oh, of what we're hearing just, yeah, i told you boring story boring story is the only one <laughs> Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> let me ask, ask you, Nancy, if you were to give people three things that were kind of key for them to lock into just to start this journey or just to become aware of what three things would you really want them to hear from our conversation today or things maybe you haven't shared yet? Um, well, there's a lot of things we can do. So simple things can be just to start being curious. And I'll give you some ideas of being cur curious is always, curious is my most favorite word. It's the word of connection mode. Because when we're curious, we don't have an answer. We don't have an outcome. So just be curious. Anytime someone's resistant, anytime something, you know, the same thing keeps happening to you. It's like you're sabotaging that. Be curious, be curious, be curious. And as a footnote of that, be curious about because there's, I can't obviously show you a lot on here of what we can do viscerally that calms the nervous system. But the second thing I do is be curious, what do we already do physically that shows us that what I'm saying, we already know. I'll give you an example. Okay. I don't know how to show you this, uh, but you can picture it when we get really um, upset intuitively all over the world. Sometimes we slap our palm of our hand on our forehead <laughs> and go, oh my gosh, right? Here's the thing. We are so intuitive. I'm going to tell everybody out there, be curious, leave your hand there. Ah. And leave it there and shut your eyes and breathe deeply. It might even take four or five minutes. And let me tell you why. Because when we go into protection mode by our biology, the blood leaves our brain to go into other parts of our body to fight. Ah. So just by doing that, and sometimes, and it may not be the first time you do it the second time, but we start to become aware of maybe a pulsing in there. Actually, there's so many other ways that I think this helps because if I was going to point my finger at you, I can't now. <laughs> if I was going to throw something, I can't. So these are the non-scientific ways of White House and the nice deep breathing. Um, so that would be an example of being aware of what kinds of things you do. We also do these things like where we take, um, when somebody's really upset, we take our hand from the top of the shoulder and stroke them down. Turns out that actually can change brain waves. And I actually like to take my hands on both sides of the um, shoulders and just come down. And again, you can just be doing that. You don't have to wait till you're upset. As a matter of fact, if you wait till you're upset and then try to do one of these things, your brain's going to go, I don't know what this is. But these are just things you can be noticing that you do and then just doing them throughout your day. Another thing that we know we do, we're on a roller coaster and we go, oh, we're about ready to go in the big long thing. We reach over and we squeeze the other person's hand, right? Yes. You may scream also, but we squeeze the hand. Squeezing is a very calming, it's for a proprioceptive system that I talked about, it's calming. So crossing over is good. So we could take our hands, squeeze, cross over the top of our shoulder, cross over, squeeze the other part, and you keep going down. I mean, I'm just giving you this teeniest little appetizers of, I can take me anywhere. I can do these anywhere. They don't cost me anything. So that would be, the first takeaway, second takeaway would be, or that oh, was my second one, um, do something different. Mm. But what I mean by that is we have all automated. The brain doesn't have an editor. So if I, uh, like I said, I yelled at somebody and maybe two out of 10 times, it made the person back off. My nervous system goes to chain. Those are great odds. They don't care, right? It doesn't <laughs> matter how many times I disconnect or whatever. So the scoreboard for our automated stress responses, whatever they are, whether we shut down, whether we yell, whether we get defensive, you know, for most of it, it's probably like, you know, 10,000 to maybe two, we've tried to maybe new techniques or whatever. So what we want to do when we're in connection, when we're already feeling good, we want to be doing these um, resolving, calming things so the scoreboard changes. But for starters, if I just do something different and I do it with curiosity, no attachment to the outcome. So it could be as simple as where I always say, if you're like, hurry up, hurry up, right? And then that gets you usually angrier. So what if I instead just said, how can I help? Hmm. What if I even said, I'm the one that's worried about being late? Okay, so I own it. It's not you. You're not causing the problem. How can I help? Right? What if my child, you know, knocks over the glass at the end of the table and my old two is going, this is a teaching moment. You shouldn't have had it too carefully. What if I just decide to hug? Mm -hmm. What if I just do something different? What if I'm 
have a habit of nagging my teenage child and she, you know, rolls her eyes back at me and I go into her room and it's a mess again, blah, blah, blah. So sometimes I can just be playful. And these are the things that we tell people to do. So you write a little, you're the mom, you write in a post-it close and you put it on your forehead and you walk into your daughter's room. Now, you're not trying to still make her do the clothes, but you're just doing something different. You're not going down your old automated stress, but her nervous system's going to look at you and what's that? <laughs> and the nervous system's like novelty. So, um, so I'd say do something different. And then the last thing would be see how many ways you can get playfulness back into your life. Mm. So we, again, are born to be playful. The brain needs to be playful as much as it needs food, drink, um, and sleep. And I don't mean that you just go out. I think Halloween that adults who really, no, I don't want to go there. I was just going to say that sometimes we need permission to be playful. So I'll, I'll frame it that way, the Halloween. I was just talking to my cousin's son who is not playful. And he was wanting to understand this. And he says, well, I was playful at Halloween. And I said, because it gave you permission in a costume and stuff. I want you to be playful. <laughs> I want you to be playful wherever. So. Uh, I'll just end with that story of an example. My daughter, this, because I, I think people think being playful means um, being goofy, which you can and all those things, but you can't be in protection mode and be goofy. See, our biology won't let it. So one of the reasons I want us to be playful and goofy is it's another way that I'm in connection mode. So I'll give you an example that wouldn't be obvious, but once you set your mind to be more playful, these become part of your life. When my first grandson was born, um, my daughter's neighbor, 10-year-old girl, gave her this doll and she'd obviously made it from her heart right but it had the scariest looking face ever <laughs> and at first i thought my daughter was exaggerating and then she showed it to me she goes mom i cannot put that in a, next to a baby <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna cause right. nightmares <laughs> right right i mean it really was but she also knew that she made it from her heart so she didn't feel like she could toss it into the trash so you know what they did that doll became a source of playfulness it started with my son-in-law first hid it in her underneath the sheets. And when they pulled the thing up, there was the doll. So then she laughed, right? And then she hid it in his a work bag. And then it was <laughs> in the cupboard. And so they took this thing that came from the heart. They, again, that's the good story. They didn't have to then, okay, then we have to make my child suffer and look at this face for maybe forever <laughs> and turned it into a playfulness that's actually a memory for them. Yeah, like a core we memory. We all have that power. So the last thing I will say is, Every single person, actually, this is my most important message. Every single person came into this world already wired for connection. Mm -hmm. There is no asterisk. I, I may seem like I'm not telling the truth because like I say, when I don't have highways in place and I don't have um, uh, a flexible nervous system and I don't care what the diagnosis is, I don't care what it is you will never convince me that we're not wired for it. Mm. So that, well, that Nancy, that's amazing. I want to thank you so, so much. How can people get in contact with you and with what you do? Um, we have the website, brainhighways.com, which we created intentionally for people to be able to spend literally hours and never pay a dime to learn more of this. Cause I know it's new for a lot of people. So like you can go to the article section and you can just pick one like, what do you mean paying attention is not like something say, you know, why is it not helpful? Or, or why is telling, um, you know, poor readers or all the myths. It's got a lot of the articles that connect from the brain. It also has in the articles, again, not saying that a diagnosis isn't real but a lot of times a diagnosis comes with limitations. Mm -hmm. So there, so what if there's also going on the lower brain or the nervous system, and then those behaviors go away. So you can pick almost any diagnosis out there and see how those behaviors are off, often are also parallel or overlapping to what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. the videos are really compelling on there because you can see people, veterans who came back, who couldn't get their life back after, you know, being in Afghanistan understand uh, panic attacks and just watching um, and understanding more about the lower brain. Uh, I wrote the book that's also on the website, but uh -huh. the reason I wrote Connection Mode was because instead of things getting better over the years of me doing this, I just see more and more people struggling. Mm -hmm. And I don't want people to think that they have to do the Brain Highways program to get on their life 
to be easier and in connection with. Mm -hmm. So I gave away so much of what we do in the book. And I do stand by this that I don't think it's, and it's an audio book too, because I know a lot of people are overwhelmed, stressed, won't read. So it's an <laughs> audio book. I know I knew that, but I, I do stand by, you cannot read the book and not at the end, look at people with more compassion and curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I gave away so many of the techniques that if you start doing them, you will be well on the path to an easier life. Mm -hmm. So those are the, um, the next steps that people are curious. Nancy, I am so grateful that you said yes to my request to be on the show today. I am just so grateful for people like you that have taken the time and spent your life to do work that is literally world changing. It's setting people free. It's bringing hope. It's bringing joy back into people's lives if they are willing to trust the process. And it's just such an, a gift that you've given to the world. And I just want to thank you so much for everything that you do and this incredible conversation. And I'm sure I can't wait to listen to the book because I have a lot of books to read. I'm a, I'm a reader. So sometimes listening helps me balance out the 40 books I have out in front of me. But thank you so, so much for doing this work and bringing it to the world, Nancy. Well, I like I say, I appreciate the chance to be able to share it because um, if even just one person today mm -hmm. went, hey, maybe. And that's all you have to do right now. Because if you're in protection mode, you're not going to go, oh, I'm totally sold. But just the yeah. maybe one step in. And like I say, and, and so to me, by having the website and having an audio book or book, it makes a real low risk from the nervous system <laughs> <laughs> to learn a little more. And like I say, you, you, the book is filled with all the stories because the story, that's how we really connect the most, right? And you will see yourself, you will see your neighbor, you will see family members, because like, like I said, the nervous system is the common denominator among all of us. It mm -hmm. works the same. So that means we've struggled, maybe not the exact episode, but we do understand. Yeah. And, um, so I'm really grateful that you gave me a chance just to, uh, wait, when you say thank me to me, I, I just feel grateful. I didn't pick any of this. It kind of picked me. And um, so inspiration, anybody just say yes. I, I don't know what I was saying yes to at the beginning. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I was like, okay, sure. We'll take the world's worst fourth graders and let's see if we can change how they are. I'm just, but um, it's an exciting life when you're living it more in connection mode and, mm -hmm. and everybody will end up doing something. That's amazing. That's what I believe. Uh, I totally agree. And today, friends, if you are finding us on YouTube, please check down below. I'm going to have these links that Nancy's talking about. So it'll be very easy to get yourself connected to these resources. If you are on a podcast and you're listening, just head to www.feminineroadmap.com forward slash episode 309. And in the show notes, I will have all of the links for Nancy there as well. And of course, I've been speaking with Nancy Sokol Green. She's an educator, the creator of Brain Highways Global, and the author of Connection Mode, How to Change Your Brain for an Easier Life. My friends, this is life-changing. I cannot stress enough that if you are listening to this, it is for you. It might feel scary. You might be excited about it. But I want to piggyback on Nancy's comment to be, get curious about it. Just allow yourself some space to be curious about it. Don't put the pressure on yourself. Just check it out. Just be interested because we are designed for this life. Life has happened. Things have happened. We've made up stories. People have told us stories and we've become something. But our biology, the way we are designed with our nervous system and our brain, there is hope for healing and wholeness and connection. And there's nothing that we need to be afraid of. It's for you to take advantage of. So I encourage you, get curious, go check out the website. And let us know, reach out to Nancy, reach out to me and let us know how this has impacted your life. And if you know of someone that can use this 
This is the one of the most powerful connection points we can do is to share. Share this message with everyone you know. Because we don't always know what someone's going through. We don't always know where they're at in their heart and their mind. And we don't know where they're at in connection with hope. This message is one of hope and freedom. So take the time to share it, please, friends. Share it with everybody. And know that that one person that Nancy is trying to reach, you might be the connection. It's for you and it's for your friends. So please share. Again, friends, I want to thank you so much for joining us today, for taking this time. This episode's been a little longer because this message needs to be told. So thank you for hanging in there with us. And I want to encourage you to continue to join me week to week as I share more in empowering people, strategies, and uh, tips for living a life that's so vibrant. Thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to sharing with you again next week. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye.